This video is kindly sponsored by Squarespace. For any aspiring content creators or business owners, Squarespace is the perfect platform to get you up and running with your own website. No coding skills needed, instead select from dozens of pre-built templates which you can customize as much or as little as you want using simple, easy to use drag and drop tools. I'm currently using Squarespace to design and build a website for Galaxy Class Pictures, my new production company. I'm the kind of person who learns software by just playing around with it. However, if you don't know where to start when designing your website, join Squarespace's Circle Community. The Circle Community is a fantastic resource for developing your own web design skills. You gain access to regular notes on your work, as well as exclusive educational content so you can make your site the best it can be, or even one day lend your skills to other websites. Follow the link in the description to start making your own website with your own domain name and use the promo code Rowan J. Coleman for 10% off your first purchase. Thank you once again to Squarespace for helping me keep the lights on over here. And now, on with the video. In the late 1970s, the ambitious and groundbreaking space opera Battlestar Galactica debuted on the big and small screen, initially to box off his success and high ratings. However, it was largely dismissed by critics at the time as a shallow Star Wars ripoff, and due to its high production costs and shifting time slot, viewership quickly dwindled, and the show was cancelled after only a single season. Yet a loyal fanbase remained, one which endured a poorly received spin-off and enjoyed further stories in novel and comic book form. But as the years went by and Battlestar Galactica continued to enjoy cult status, the foundations would be laid for Battlestar Galactica's return. Despite its unceremonious cancellation and failed spin-off show, Battlestar Galactica remained popular among its cult fanbase, and the iconography of the Cylons, Vipers, and the Galactica itself bled into the wider pop culture. The series had managed to step out of the shadow of the often compared to Star Wars, selling well in international markets and on home video throughout the 80s and 90s. The mythos was further expanded in a range of novels and comic books as well. It was clear to the series' rights holders and to sci-fi fandom overall that there was an appetite for more Battlestar Galactica, but it was unclear exactly what form it should take. An attempt at reinvigorating the series with Galactica 1980 had already failed. The original sets had long been destroyed, and key cast members like Lorne Green had passed away. Nevertheless, Richard Hatch, who played Apollo in the original series, campaigned for a sequel series called Battlestar Galactica The Second Coming. He even went so far as creating a proof-of-concept pilot, featuring several returning cast members and new CG effects. It was the seventh era of mankind. Twenty yarns had passed since the last great war. civilization was reborn, an enemy had grown, and now a new generation will have to face an old foe. I must prepare them for the second coming. He spent much of 1990 touring the convention circuit with a trailer of the Proof of Concept pilot, which received praise from fans and allegedly did interest some of the executives at Universal. Universal, however, were already developing other pitches for a possible Battlestar Galactica revival. One such pitch was a feature film version following the Battlestar Pegasus, produced by original BSG creator Glenn A. Larson and Wing Commander producer Todd Moyer. Another proposal was for a sequel by X-Men producer Tom DeSanto in the form of a miniseries which could serve as a backdoor pilot for a show. A collaboration between Universal and the Fox Network, this revival attempt actually got quite far, with concept art created and even some sets beginning construction. However, DeSanto eventually had to abandon the project when production delays caused a scheduling conflict with X-Men 2. The notion of a miniseries which could potentially lead to a full series was still appealing to Universal, and so they approached producer David Icke. 
David Icke spent much of his career at that point working alongside Sam Raimi on Hercules' legendary journeys, Xena Warrior Princess, Darkman, and American Gothic. He had first worked with Universal on the short-lived TV series Cover Me, based on the true life of an FBI family. Ike was interested in taking on the project, and although he was a major cinephile, he didn't have much knowledge of science fiction or the original Battlestar Galactica. Therefore, he sought out Ronald D. Moore. In contrast to Ike, Ronald D. Moore had been working in the science fiction genre for almost all of his professional career up until that point. He got his start on Star Trek Next Generation after submitting a spec script to then-showrunner Michael Piller. He would go on to write and or produce 27 episodes of the show, winning the Hugo Award for co-writing the finale All Good Things and co-writing the feature films Star Trek Generations and Star Trek First Contact. He also contributed massively to Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Moore's time with Star Trek came to an abrupt end when he had a falling out with longtime writing partner Brannon Braga during Moore's brief stint working on Star Trek Voyager. Following Star Trek, Moore became showrunner of the sci-fi series Roswell and consulted on Good vs. Evil, where he met David Icke. When asked by Ike to develop a new Battlestar Galactica, Moore saw it as a chance to evolve the science fiction TV formula, which he believed had become stagnant by the 2000s. That was really, really important to me, that I wasn't going to... We weren't going to run into alien cultures, we weren't going to run into other spaceships, we weren't going to do bumpy-headed aliens, and we were going to wipe every one of those cliches off the board that we possibly could. Rather than taking inspiration from genre giants like Star Trek, Ronald D. Moore instead looked to thriller shows like 24 and political dramas like The West Wing. His ultimate goal was to create a military drama in space. Stylistically, it would resemble a documentary with lots of handheld camera, and the characters, rather than being the paragons of virtue as seen in Star Trek or the grand mythological hero seen in the original BSG, would be flawed contemporary humans. That being said, Ronald D. Moore was actually quite fond of the original series, and drew heavily from its larger mythos to craft his vision for the new series. The origin of the Cylons as machines who turned against their creators, reptilian aliens in the original series, was transposed onto the Colonial's history instead. Human form Cylons had previously appeared in Galactica 1980 and the comic books. For the new show, the Cylon Centurions would be entirely CG creations. Therefore, the use of human looking Cylons was not only practical, but also a great storytelling avenue. Some other notable changes concerned the cast of characters. Making Starbuck a woman was one of the first things that I thought of, and then as I was sort of stroking out who all the cast of characters were, it, you know, the original Galactic was just very male-oriented, and trying to just sort of even it up and make it more interesting, some of the roles naturally just became women to make it a more interesting show. However, these characters, like many others, would also be given a name change. The original names Apollo, Starbuck, Boomer, etc. would be changed to call signs for the various fighter and shuttle pilots. Adama, Ty, and Baltar would also be given new first names. To play Commander William Adama, the script was sent to a number of prominent actors, many of whom rejected it outright based on the title alone. When we sat with this script that had taken months and months to develop, I was suddenly terrified by something rather unexpected, which was that the title, Battlestar Galactica, made me not really want to turn the page. And I thought, this is potentially disastrous. We've got this magnificent document, this compelling, adult, terrifying, visceral, allegorical piece of science fiction, science fiction in the truest sense of the, world, of the word, science fiction in the sense of the word that it had sort of been invented to, to operate as, which is as an allegory for our times. And yet no one's going to know any of that because the people who we really want to get excited about this, the director we hire, the actors we hire, are going to see Battlestar Galactica and look at their agent and go, are you kidding me? One such actor was Edward James Olmos. So when <laughs> Battlestar came up, I had no, was not going to read it. And my wife was sitting at the table where we were doing some signing at this book festival, and she opened the, the, the script and read three pages that Ron Moore wrote at the beginning of the script, like a um, prologue of what the intention was of the show. Now, I remember when the first time I met Eddie, and uh, we were sitting down to, to talk about the character, and he started talking about that, the manifesto, he was like, that thing, you know, it was just, 
it was really profound and it really made me made me really see what you're doing and I was like I didn't know what he was talking about I was like the manifesto the what and I kind of looked at David and I think David kind of like I, mean, I don't know what he's talking about <laughs> it took us like a few minutes and then realized oh he read that sales thing that we put up I was more gratified than ever when Edward James almost came in for his first meeting and said were it not for that document <laughs> I never would have read it. And I remember after Eddie left talking to David, like, did the actors get that? And he was like, well, I didn't think the actors got that. I guess they did. And we were like, well, I hope, it, I guess it's all right. <laughs> after being convinced to read it, he was greatly impressed by the quality of writing. He accepted the part, but only on the condition the show never feature any aliens, a condition which I can more happily agree to. The moment I see one four-eyed creature coming at me, I'm going to faint on camera, and I'm off the show. We wouldn't even, you know, have to book his flight. He'd already be on a plane. I'm just going to go, ah, and faint, faint away. And then I'm going to stand up after they cut, and I'm going to walk off the show, and you can say, well, he died of a heart attack, or you can do whatever you want to do. Almost got his start in theater, his big break coming from his Tony-nominated role in the play Zoot Suit. Off the back of his stage success, he moved into feature films appearing in Blade Runner and The Ballad of Gregorio Cortez. He came close to landing the villainous role of Krug in Star Trek III The Search for Spock, and was actually pursued for the role of Jean-Luc Picard in Star Trek The Next Generation, but he was refused the former and declined the latter. Instead, he spent much of the 80s and 90s winning acclaim through numerous roles in independent dramas, such as Stand and Deliver, American Me, and Selena. Playing William Adama's son Lee Apollo Adama was English actor Jamie Bamber. Battlestar Galactica was essentially Bamber's break into American television. Beforehand, he played the regular role of Archie Kennedy in ITV's series of Hornblower TV movies. Completing the main trio of the original show was Katie Sackhoff as Kara Starbuck Thrace. Sackhoff started her acting career in her late teens, making appearances in Undressed and The Education of Max Bickford, before moving into feature films. She appeared in My First Mister and Halloween Resurrection. Like many in the BSG cast, Sackhoff went through numerous auditions before her self-tape was singled out by Ike and Moore's wives. English actor James Callis went through six auditions in total before landing the role of Gaius Baltar. Callis was a veteran of the stage, having performed in many West End productions. He had also directed two feature films alongside his regular acting work in British TV and film. Playing opposite Callis for much of the series would be the mysterious number six, played by Canadian actress Trisha Helfer. Helfer had an extremely successful career as a model before getting her start in acting. Her first role was in the post-apocalyptic drama Jeremiah, and she also appeared in an episode of CSI. Due to her lack of acting experience when she landed her role as Six in BSG, network executives were unsure of her casting. However, when they viewed dailies of her scenes, they were allegedly so impressed, they decided to center the entire miniseries marketing campaign around her character. Another new character was Laura Roslin, the education secretary turned president, played by Mary McDonnell. McDonnell, like almost, was a huge get for the series, being a two-time Academy Award-nominated actress for her roles in Dances with Wolves and Passion Fish. Though she was no stranger to science fiction, having appeared in Independence Day and Donnie Darko. Canadian actor Michael Hogan was also no stranger to the genre, having appeared in Millennium, The Outer Limits, and Andromeda before landing the role of Colonel Saul Tai in BSG. Hogan would also lend his voice to several video games, including Skyrim and the Mass Effect series, which also featured Trisha Helfer. The character Chief Tyrrell was originally envisioned as a much older man than Aaron Douglas, who won the role. After Galactica, Douglas would later make notable appearances in the likes of Dirk Gently's Holistic Detective Agency and Van Helsing. Chief Tyrrell's secret lover, Sharon Boomer Valeri, was played by Grace Park. Before BSG, Park had mostly landed small bit parts in various TV and film productions, including Stargate SG-1 and Dark Angel. She later landed a starring role in the revival of Hawaii Five-0 and appeared in the video game Command and Conquer 3 alongside Trisha Helfer. Filming began on the 1st of April 2003 in and around Vancouver, British Columbia, directed by Australian filmmaker Michael Reimer, with cinematography by Joel Ransom shooting on 35mm film. 
The bulk of filming took place at Vancouver Film Studios, where the Galactica interior sets were built. Working with production designer Richard Hudelin, Ronald D. Moore drew on his experiences touring on the USS WS Sims and other visits to US Navy vessels to give the Galactica sets a sense of authenticity. The art department was told to steer away from typical sci-fi genre tropes like sliding doors, touchscreen panels, and holograms. Instead, the world of this new series would skew much closer to our own. Doors aboard ships would be heavy and metallic, phones would have cords, and people would wear normal suits rather than robes. To this end, the Galactica design itself would be augmented, so its hull would resemble a bomb shelter, and its docking pods would retract inside the central body when making FTL jumps. The Viper design from the original series was mostly retained with some slight adjustments to the canopy, engines, and detailing. This nod to the classic design was dubbed Mark II, next to the more advanced Mark VII. The visual effects were handled mostly by Zoic Studios, and supervised by Gary Hutzel. Hutzel had previously worked on both Star Trek The Next Generation and Deep Space Nine, and Zoic Studios had just come off working on Firefly. As a nod to their previous work, the Serenity actually makes a small cameo near the beginning of the miniseries. In keeping with the intended realistic documentary style, Ronald D. Moore asked for Gary Hutzel to treat the effects as if they were being filmed for real. This led to the inclusion of an overall darker lighting aesthetic, as well as whip pans, snap zooms, and messier framing. The Cylon Centurions were made CG characters, after it was decided a performer in a suit would look too cheesy in comparison to the grounded look of the series. The score for the miniseries, composed mostly by Richard Gibbs with additional music from Bear McCreary, also broke with tradition. Rather than a grand orchestral score driven by brass and strings, Gibbs opted for more world music like Japanese taiko drums and Mediterranean woodwinds and vocals. Having waited so long for Battlestar Galactica to return to their screens, the announcement of a remake was met with immediate and fierce backlash from many fans. Further news about the intended tone and style, as well as story and character changes, was met with even more backlash. Dirk Benedict even joined many fans in their disapproval over changing Starbuck to a female character. Initially, there was good feeling towards the new series, with a much-publicized meeting between Benedict and Katie Sackhoff, where Benedict passes Sackhoff a cigar as a kind of passing of the torch. However, Benedict would later lambast the show in a tirade featured in Dreamwatch magazine. Another fierce critic was Richard Hatch. Everybody was very pissed off, to put it mildly, that they were not going to do a continuation of Battlestar Galactica, along with me, who was very upset as well. I had spent um, almost... I would say three years going to Universal, meeting with the legal office, meeting with executives, pitching the idea of bringing back the show and why it should be brought back. And we had put so much time and energy into it. There had been polls on Sci-Fi Channel and, of course, 80, 90 percent everybody wanted to see a continuation. And I hate to say it, most remakes are... Let's say, they suck. While Ronald D. Moore tried to mitigate this backlash by communicating directly with fans through online forums, something he started doing while working on Deep Space Nine, and Universal tried to downplay the remake aspect by using the term reimagining, it did little to quell fan tempers. This backlash seemingly reached a head before the release of the miniseries when, during a press conference, Edward James almost stated outright, If you're a diehard fan of the original Battlestar Galactica, please don't watch. Sci-Fi Channel wants you to think everyone will like this. They won't. So please don't watch. Buy the DVD of the original series, and when we're on, pop that in instead. I don't want you writing me any more letters. Regardless of what fans thought, the reimagined Battlestar Galactica premiered on the Sci-Fi Channel on the 8th of December, 2003. Whenever I go about yet another rewatch of all the 90s Star Trek shows and Babylon 5 and Farscape and so on, Returning to Battlestar Galactica, even after a decade, feels like the genre of space opera television suddenly received some kind of adrenaline shot. To borrow a friend's phrase, Battlestar Galactica marks the end of the plasticine forehead era of science fiction. Those older shows are among my all-time favourites, but even the most die-hard fan has to admit in engaging in immense suspensions of disbelief while watching. 
The production design in the next generation Babylon 5 Stargate et al. was always terrific, but we never really believed people were actually crewing spaceships or space stations or visiting alien worlds. We all knew these were plywood sets in Los Angeles or Vancouver. We all recognized the Vasquez rocks and British Columbian forests. And we all knew many of the aliens encountered week to week were actors wearing hastily designed prosthetics. But that same suspension of disbelief is no longer needed with Battlestar Galactica. This is a world which feels far more tactile and real. It's worth remembering that this show was on the air at the same time as Andromeda, Stargate Atlantis, and Star Trek Enterprise. But while those shows feel firmly rooted in the late 90s and early 2000s, Battlestar Galactica could have come out yesterday. The Galactica looks and feels as close to a real-world Navy vessel without straight up pulling a silent running and shooting on the USS Valley Forge. It feels functional and believable in a way Star Trek's Enterprise never quite achieved. But beyond the excellent production design, the ship also feels truly lived in. Little things like Adama slurping down noodles or Ty sitting on Adama's jacket feel so authentic and natural and really embodies that documentary feel the show is going for. The new approach to world building also makes this interpretation of the BSG universe feel a lot closer to home than virtually any other sci fi series. None of this is a result of laziness. Every one of these elements are deliberate choices on the part of the production staff. The original series depicted a mother civilization, but this version of Galactica aims to depict a mirror civilization, a creative goal which also factors heavily into the characters. I often see a lot of the detractors of this series criticizing the characters as being bad examples for the viewer. How can anyone look up to these people, they'll say. To me, this criticism betrays a somewhat narrow view of what characters in a sci-fi show are supposed to be like. This is not Star Trek. The story is not a morality play. The characters are not intended as paragons of virtue for the viewer to admire. Instead, like the world they inhabit, the cast of Battlestar Galactica is intended to function as a mirror for the audience. The crew of the Galactica is made up of rookies and retirees. Older officers like Adama and Tai are content to round out their careers and settle back into civilian life. Tyrrell's deck crew are average Joe Grease monkeys, simply putting in their time on a literal museum piece before no doubt moving on to something better. Adama isn't running a tight ship here, in fact it's shown to be quite sloppy, with a clearly alcoholic XO and fraternizations during work hours. I can understand why this approach to characterization would be jarring to fans of other sci-fi shows preceding BSG, but it's not a mistake or flaw as so many detractors proclaim it to be. In a way, the new version of Starbucks sums up this more realistic approach nicely. Katie Sackhoff's fantastic turn as Kara Thrace at first seems to embody the classic archetype to a T, a cigar-smoking, card-playing, hotshot pilot. But whereas the original series took this archetype and assigned it to Dirk Benedict's charming rogue, the reimagined series decides this is the behaviour of a volatile screw-up, who will happily deck her superior officer without any consideration as to the consequences. This same storytelling philosophy is also what turns the relationship between Adama and Apollo from a straight-laced wise mentor and noble hero into a difficult one between Adama and Lee, where a devastating family tragedy has left them estranged and hostile to one another. This isn't conflict for the sake of conflict. The problems and struggles these characters go through are all ones many of us can relate to as a viewer, even if we wish we didn't. In this strive for realism and relatability wherever possible, the relationship between Gaius, Baltar, and Number Six could have stood out as a tonal anomaly, but thanks to some clever writing and outstanding performances, it succeeds in threading the needle. Baltar, rather than being as delightfully evil as John Colicos's take on the character, is vain, egotistical, self-centered, pompous, and cowardly. Yet he still comes across as a real person rather than a caricature. His part in the destruction of the Twelve Colonies is a result of his weakness rather than his malice. Baltar is truly detestable on paper, but James Callis' performance is also unexpectedly very funny. The lows the character is willing to sink to end up becoming darkly comedic, making the viewer laugh instead of becoming further outraged. Trisha Helfer, meanwhile, is simply an incredible discovery. It's no wonder Universal opted to make Number 6 the centerpiece of their marketing, as Helfer tackles the truly thankless task of sexy robot lady with remarkable poise and intelligence. A near unearthly beauty with a soothing, warm voice, but always with an undercurrent of danger and sense of threat. 
Helfer also showcases some real versatility in playing multiple versions of the same character. The version later known as Caprica 6 is just as alluring as Head 6, but while Caprica 6 conveys some subtle vulnerability and rage, Head 6 takes on an angelic quality. She's the version of the person Baltar imagines she was. The dynamic between Baltar and Six is especially fascinating in its ambiguity. Six could indeed be a chip inside Gaius Baltar's brain, installed there by the Cylons, or he could simply be having a psychotic break. Six could be feeding him intelligence from the enemy, but then again, she never tells him anything he couldn't infer or deduce on his own. There's also a fresh approach taken with the space-based action. Rather than achieving victory through overwhelming force, the Cylons cripple colonial forces and massacre helpless soldiers and civilians. Rather than hitting the viewer with spectacular space battles, the destruction of the colonies is a terrifying and bleak event, precisely because so much of it happens off-screen. Entire fleets are wiped out via radio reports, cities are engulfed in nuclear fire signalled by ominous mushroom clouds on the horizon. Before Galactica can even get a shot off on the enemy, the war has already been lost. Although the fleet manages to jump away to relative safety, a harsh reality soon sets in, prompting a desperate but convincing rallying call from Adama. We've jumped way beyond the red line into uncharted space. Limited supplies, limited fuel, no allies, and now, no hope. Where shall we go? What shall we do? Life here began out there. Those are the first words of the sacred scrolls. Elosha, there's a 13th colony of humankind, is there not? The scrolls tell us a 13th tribe left Cobol in the early days. They traveled far and made their home upon a planet called Earth. We have a refuge to go to. A refuge? that the Cylons know nothing about. On the memory of those lying here before you, we shall find it, and Earth will become our new home. So say we all. 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 Dismissed. Part 1 of the miniseries debuted to strong, if not extraordinary, ratings of 3.2 million viewers. Expecting the usual ratings drop for Part 2, David Icke and Ronald D. Moore were told the miniseries would be considered successful if Part 2 stayed above 2.8 million viewers. It was a surprise to all when Part 2 actually jumped up in the ratings to 3.8 million viewers, making the miniseries one of the Sci-Fi Channel's highest rated programs. Despite the fierce fan backlash, the series appeared to have succeeded in winning over a new audience, as well as critics. The miniseries went on to win the Saturn Award for Best Television Series and earned a further four Emmy nominations. It was clear David Icke and Ronald D. Moore's gamble had paid off. The huge departures from typical sci-fi TV traditions had caught the attention of not only longtime fans of the genre, but a broader audience as well. With such high ratings, critical praise, and strong word of mouth, Battlestar Galactica was picked up for a 13-episode first season. Viewing the miniseries as a kind of pilot for the show, Ike and Moore decided to retain some elements and change others. The character Carl Hilo Agathon, played by Tamo Pinnaket, was originally meant to be assumed dead after the miniseries. However, the creative team all liked Pinnaket's performance so much, they decided to keep him on for the first season, leading to the creation of a brand new storyline on Cylon-occupied Caprica. Candice McClure's Duala, Alessandro Giuliani's Gaeta, Nikki Klein's Callie, and Paul Campbell's Billy, originally intended to be one-offs or mere background players, were kept on and developed further as part of the core cast. While director Michael Reimer was hired for further episodes, cinematographer Joel Ransom was replaced with DOP Stephen McNutt, who chose to shoot the series on HD digital cameras as opposed to 35mm film. Bear McCreary, who composed additional music for the miniseries, was promoted to main composer for the actual show. The first season was also co-commissioned by Sky Television. 
Season 1 premiered in the UK on the 18th of October 2004 and debuted in the US and Canada on the 15th of January 2005. True to form, Season 1 kicks things off by pulling the rug out from under the viewer. Instead of beginning the story with the fleet safe as it was at the end of the miniseries, the series proper throws us into the action. 33 presents us with a high-intensity mystery culminating in Apollo and Starbuck possibly gunning down a ship full of civilians to stop the Cylons tracking their fleet. Water shows us a desperate struggle for survival underpinned by Boomer's spiralling sense of panic as she starts to suspect she may be a Cylon. These first two episodes are characteristic of the first season as a whole, a military drama where interpersonal conflicts are deftly woven into high-stakes plots, where difficult political, social and philosophical questions are raised, usually without solid answers being provided. The early episodes also establish a slightly new look for the show. While the miniseries established the documentary shooting style, the series proper runs with it, Director Sergio Mimica Gezin in particular opting to shoot almost exclusively with longer lenses and handheld camera. I feel this documentary style can go overboard at times, the camera becoming too shaky and the framing getting too tight. This is especially pronounced in the action scenes. The space-based action is generally captured very well, but land-based shootouts or fight scenes end up far too chaotic and hard to follow at times. Because of the show's larger mission of winning over non-sci-fi fans, the first season features a healthy mix of arc-heavy installments and standalone episodes. Act of Contrition and You Can't Go Home Again pushes the Adama-Kara relationship to the forefront with a thrilling and emotionally hard-hitting adventure. Kara. Yeah. Six Degrees of Separation is essentially a whole hour of James Callis chewing scenery to fantastic results. Struck a nerve, have I? Which I find rather impossible to believe. You think this is over? This is not over! You have not had the last! No more Mr. Nice Guys! The standout among the standalone episodes, however, is easily the Hand of God. Having fled the Cylons for weeks, the fleet is running low on a crucial fuel, and the only source available is guarded by a Cylon base. As a semi-remake of the original series finale, Adama decides to stop running and attack the Cylons directly. The Hand of God is a well-placed piece of emotional catharsis for the audience. The opening two episodes do such a brilliant job of pulling the viewer into the grim tone of the series and the desperation of the fleet situation. The only reprieve the characters get are sparse moments of calm where they have successfully hidden from their Cylon pursuers for a short time. But after running for so long, the episode not only delivers the goods with some spectacular space-based action, but also with its character development. Starbuck, still recovering from her injuries in acts of contrition, is forced to sit on the sidelines as Lee flies the mission instead, striving to prove his own abilities as a pilot to Kara and commander to his father. The victory is by no means easy and the larger circumstances of the fleet go mostly unchanged, but the feeling of elation which washes over the characters when they succeed in their mission is one of the show's most moving and triumphant moments. And it's here I want to highlight Bear McCreary's music for the show. While Richard Biggs established the musical identity of the series, McCreary takes those initial ideas of the miniseries score and runs with them. The emotional climax of Hand of God is carried beautifully by the surprising use of Gallic folk music, yet for whatever reason, it absolutely works, becoming the de facto theme for Lee and his father's relationship. <laughs> What emerges as the central theme of the first season is the tension between civilian and military rule. The portrayal of civilian government in the original series was always one of its weak points. The Quorum of Twelve were, for the most part, elderly idiots whose proposed courses of action were always overtly moronic. A device for Adama to showcase his wisdom and intelligence by contrast. The resulting connotation, intentional or not, is that the military strongman is always right and should never be questioned, while a civilian government is naive, fickle and corrupt. 
This implication of the original series is directly addressed in the writing of the Reimagined show. The relationship between Commander Adama and President Roslin is easily one of the most potent in the series, precisely because it goes against typical expectations. As their relationship develops over the course of the season, it becomes clear that it is Roslin who is the pragmatist, whereas Adama is the idealist. You have the only armed, disciplined force. There's a reason why you separate military and the police. One fights the enemy of the state, the other serves and protects the people. When the military becomes both, then the enemies of the state tend to become the people. Commander, I won't let that happen. In the aforementioned You Can't Go Home Again, we see how driven by emotion Adama is, despite how inscrutable Edward James Olmos' expression usually is maintaining a hopeless search and rescue for Starbuck long after it's logical, and being shamed into abandoning the search by Roslyn. And if it was me down there instead? You don't have to ask that. Are you sure? If it were you, we'd never leave. On the other hand, Roslyn demonstrates her resourcefulness and cunning in episodes like Flesh and Bone and Colonial Day, sanctioning the torture and execution of a Cylon prisoner and stabbing her political ally in the back to make the more popular guy as Baltar vice president. I never thought you'd fit in with the bare knuckle backstabbing politicians. I guess I was wrong. It's fair to say that the leadership of the fleet can be seen as illegitimate, a fact pointed out by Richard Hatch's Tom Zarek. Bringing Hatch into the reimagined series was a real coup on the part of the showrunners. Richard Hatch had been a figurehead in the initial fan backlash the show received, objecting to the very idea of a remake in the first place. Hence the inherent marketing value of having the two Apollos literally face off against each other in Bastille Day. After finishing shooting for his first episode, Hatch turned from one of the most vocal critics to one of the most outspoken advocates of the new series. What makes Tom Zarek such a compelling character is both his ambiguity, but also his criticisms of Roslyn and Adama actually having a lot of substance. President Roslyn is unelected, Adama has abused his military authority, and the desire to maintain the societal structures of the Twelve Colonies within the fleet doesn't make much sense. Although he may have a checkered past, Zarek is never made out to be an explicit villain in the series. This tension within the leadership of the fleet finally breaks in the season finale Koble's last gleaming. Starbuck feels betrayed when she learns that Adama lied about the existence of Earth, Roslyn breaks her promise to Adama by circumventing his authority, and Adama's attempt at removing Roslyn from power is further complicated by Lee turning against his superior officer. This chaos serves as the backdrop to Boomer's arc reaching its climax, where her worst fears are confirmed, and she is revealed as a Cylon sleeper agent. We love you, Sharon. And we always will. Yet even after this revelation, the emotional repercussions of Roslyn's removal from office and Lee's arrest is so prominent in the viewer's mind that we are completely unprepared for this moment. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Battlestar Galactica's first season was an immense success for the Sci-Fi Channel and Universal. It had even managed to overcome the initial fan backlash and accrue its own dedicated following, helped considerably by Ronald D. Moore's online interactions with fans via regular forum posts and a concurrent podcast of episode commentaries. The show's production had been a gamble from the start, bringing back the series as a remake instead of a continuation, completely reapproaching the look and feel of a science fiction series, and ending the first season on a cliffhanger, with no guarantee the ratings would continue to be as strong as they were at the beginning.
resolving the Season 1 cliffhanger would be no easy feat. Following Rosalind's removal from office and Adama being shot, the chaos seen at the conclusion of Season 1 would not be neatly wrapped up in a single episode to open Season 2. Instead, six episodes of the second season, including a two-parter, are dedicated to resolving the lingering questions from Kobold's last gleaming. In a way, Scattered Through to Home Parts 1 and 2 are really the conclusion of Season 1, and much like the beginning of the first season, the viewer is thrown right into the action as Colonel Ty suddenly finds himself in command of Galactica and cut off unexpectedly from the fleet. But it's here we see why Ty, despite being an alcoholic, is kept around by Adama as his XO. Far from being a disaster, Ty is able to take the Galactica through a full-on battle and boarding action. As a quick aside, I have to give praise to the visual effects in the series. Purely on a design level, the digital documentary camera and Galactica's use of a flak field creates a kind of space battle which had never been seen up until this point. But it's the lowered brightness and high contrast lighting which really allows the show's effects to stand up so well after so many years. Texture and simulation technology has certainly come a long way since, but Battlestar Galactica's visual effects are head and shoulders above the other sci-fi shows at the time. The Centurions are not quite as successful, the effects showing their age much more, however that doesn't detract from their sense of threat in the episode Valley of Darkness. In contrast to the cool-looking cannon fodder of the original show, these Cylons are lethal, vicious, and virtually indestructible to regular firearms. It's only by the fourth episode that the viewer is allowed to catch a well-earned breather as the show expands the scope of the plot to focus on multiple ongoing story threads. Kara reuniting with Hilo, encountering the other Sharon, and linking up with the Caprica Resistance, Roslyn escaping custody and returning to Kobol with the help of Lee and Zarek, the linchpin of all these threads eventually coming together being Adama's return to command. Although Ty proves himself to be a capable commander in an emergency, his handling of the civilian government, the Galactica, and the fleet at large outside of an emergency is disastrous. One would expect Adama's return to signal a reckoning for Ty's actions, but having survived a near-death experience, Adama shows he's a changed man. Throughout most of Season 1, Adama is almost totally inscrutable, playing his emotions so reservedly that even his own son isn't sure whether his father truly cares for him. Adama, going forward in Season 2, is a much more open person, expressing his emotions more freely. Although he initially chooses to leave Rosalind's rebels behind on Kobol, ultimately he and those around him have simply lost too much to keep fighting each other. Mr. Gator. I want to see all recon material on Koval immediately in my quarters. Koval? Yes. I'm putting the fleet back together. I'm putting our family back together. This ends now. Their reconciliation on Koval, which brings them a step closer to finding Earth, manages to be very moving reprising the end of the miniseries with Adama once again rallying the fleet to Rosalind's side. Even so, this is not back to business as usual, with the other Sharon now aboard Galactica, and more questions for Baltar after he definitively discovers that Six is not a Cylon chip in his head. And who? Or what? Are you? I'm an angel of God sent here to protect you, to guide you, to love you. To what end? The end of the human race. After wrapping up the fallout of Season 1, Season 2 becomes defined by the appearance of the Battlestar Pegasus. Much like Hand of God, Pegasus is essentially a remake of the living legend from the original series. On behalf of the officers and the crew of the Pegasus, welcome back to the Colonial Fleet. <laughs> But a choice which I think elevates the newer version is to have Adama become subordinate to Admiral Kane, played by the brilliant Michelle Forbes. Rather than Adama retaining his authority, forcing Kane to scheme to undermine him, Kane having authority over Adama allows the story to spearhead its central theme of extremism. The storyline between Sharon and Agathon becomes an integral part of this theme, as slowly but surely over the course of the first season, this version of Sharon proved herself to be a fully realized thinking and feeling person, not a ruthless automaton. 
In some respects, this was already shown with the various Sixes and Leoben, but Sharon turning against her own kind to be with Agathon cements the idea of each Cylon as an individual in their own right. Though their larger cultures may be opposed, on a very basic level there is little difference between human and Cylon, which is what makes their treatment by the Pegasus crew so shocking. For the Pegasus crew, nothing is off limits in achieving victory against the enemy. By the time they meet up with the Galactica, it's clear dishing out sadistic abuse has become the point. No longer fighting to save lives, but fighting simply to do harm. For much of the episode, the Galactica crew have to endure the injustices and indignities doled out to them as Kane asserts her authority. Thus, when Tyrrell and Agathon are given a sham trial and sentenced to death for inadvertent manslaughter while stopping the Pegasus crew abusing Sharon, Adama finally saying enough is enough is as gratifying as it is nerve-wracking. Why are you launching Vipers? Please arrange for Chief Tyrrell and Lieutenant Agathon to be handed over to my Marines. I don't take orders from you. Call it whatever you like. I'm getting my men. Though the conflict between Galactica and Pegasus is put on hold to deal with the Cylon resurrection ship, Adama and Kane's simultaneous assassination plots essentially serves as a test for each character's moral compass. In some ways, both of them are succumbing to the same extremism. Adama and Roslyn view Kane as a monstrous tyrant, while Kane views Adama as a naive coward. While Kane's plot to murder Adama fits with her anything it takes to win ethos, Adama attempting the same thing breaks with his usually idealistic stance of there being certain lines that one simply does not cross. The razor-sharp tension in the last act of Resurrection Ship Part 2 is due in large part to what it would mean for these characters to actually go through with their respective plans. Will Kane's fanaticism be broken, or will Adama, by crossing that line, become just like her? I've been thinking about what we talked about before. It's not enough to survive. One has to be worthy of surviving. Congratulations, Jack. Thank you, sir. That's all. Yes, sir. <laughs> Unfortunately, following the conclusion of Resurrection Ship, Season 2 suffers from a handful of weaker standalone episodes. Ronald D. Moore admitted that he struggled with these episodes, not having a clear picture of exactly what to do with them. None of them are overtly terrible, in fact Scar is a solid piece of character-driven space action, but other outings like Black Market do tend to drag the overall quality of the season down. Thankfully, the conclusion of the season ends the show's second year on a high, a finale which is truly striking in its boldness. Though the true finale is the two-parter Lay Down Your Burdens, its prologue is the excellent Downloaded. Having Trisha Helfer reprise her role as Caprica Six for a story told entirely from the Cylon perspective is already compelling enough, but the inclusion of Caprica Six's own head, Boltar, is a stroke of genius. That mission could be profoundly Disturbing. Disturbing? Which means sleeping with me or killing billions of people, because I rather thought you enjoyed sleeping with me. Caprica 6 and the original Boomer using their status as heroes to the Cylon people to potentially usher in peace is a daring direction to take the larger story in. That daringness is also present in the fleet storyline, as the discovery of a habitable planet hidden from Cylon detection triggers a leadership challenge which Boltar is poised to win. Once again, Roslyn proves her cunning when she knowingly allows her campaign team to rig the election in her favour. Yet once again, Roslyn's obstinacy clashes with Adama's idealism, forcing her to admit her wrongdoing and cede power to Boltar. You won't do it. Excuse me. You try to steal this election, you'll die inside. Likely move your cancer right to your heart. I'd have to live with it. It's the wrong choice. Yes, it is. 
So that's it. We just give it up, just like that. The bell, perhaps. But not the war. While these are crucially important moments for these characters, the substance of the plot is not too far outside the ordinary for Battlestar Galactica. That is, until a sudden one-year time jump. For the closing minutes of the episode, the usual status quo has irrevocably changed. Not only has the fleet settled on the world now known as New Caprica, but almost every character has had some kind of major development. Kara is married to former Resistance fighter Anders, Lee is married to Dewala aboard the Pegasus, Agathon is now Adama's XO, Geta has become Baltar's chief advisor, the list goes on. Television shows of the time, especially sci-fi ones, simply did not do this. For all viewers at the time knew, this could have meant the show centering entirely on New Caprica from this point forward. But even this new status quo isn't safe, as the Cylons return once again, forcing Galactica and Pegasus to flee and placing New Caprica under occupation. Judgment Day. As enticing as the prospect of setting an entire season on New Caprica may have been, entering season 3, it soon became clear that the costs of location shooting every week, not to mention CG set extensions and a larger cast, wouldn't be feasible. Therefore, the New Caprica storyline would only take up the first four episodes of season 3. That being said, those four episodes are squeezed for every ounce of drama possible to stunning success. Although Caprica 6 and Boomer's goals may have seemed noble, their actions are still ultimately authoritarian. They still view Cylons as inherently superior, and humanity needs to be taught a better way. This power dynamic is seized upon by Dean Stockwell in an excellent turn as Cavill, who clearly still believes the colonists deserve nothing less than brutal subjugation, if not outright extermination. We round up the leaders of the insurgency and we execute them, publicly. We round up at random groups off the street and we execute them, publicly. The insurgency stops now or else we start reducing the human population to a more manageable size. In a sense, Caprica 6 and Boomer find themselves playing a key role in exactly the kind of hypocrisy they were attempting to fight. Mass murder, exploitation, and abuse are doled out on a seemingly daily basis, all the while the Cylons insist it's for the colonists' own good. Under such oppression, the colonists are divided as to how to live under Cylon rule. Colonel Tai, cut off from his wife and a victim of sustained torture, lashes out against the Cylons by condoning the use of suicide bombers, against the wishes of other rebels. No more suicide bombings, Colonel. You understand? What, are you working for the Cylons now? I'm sorry, man, it's no excuse for that. You know, sometimes I think that you've got ice water in those veins, and other times I think you're just a naive little school teacher. At the same time, the show is not unsympathetic to the human collaborators, who see joining the Cylons as the only way to endure this nightmare. This tension between the colonists comes to a head in Exodus Part 2, when Ty's wife, Ellen, is outed as a traitor to the Resistance. You know what has to be done here. And you don't want to do it. I understand, but believe me, Colonel, someone is gonna do this. In this grueling scene, Ty is utterly broken as a man as he chooses to murder his own wife. I love you. You hear me? <laughs> much like Hand of God, after enduring so much darkness, the Galactica finally coming in to rescue the colonists brings some well-earned catharsis. Though the mission is by no means easy, the episode manages to pack in plenty of fan-pleasing moments, such as the Galactica pulling off an atmospheric jump to launch its vipers behind enemy lines. And the Battlestar Pegasus going down in a blaze of glory.
While ultimately victorious, the closing scene of the episode makes clear that the legacy of New Caprica will linger for a long time. As Adama reunites with his old friend and XO, the pain in Tai's voice turns triumph into heartbreak. You did it. You brought him home, so. Not all of them. While a good chunk of Season 3 is dedicated to the quest for Earth, the legacy of New Caprica is really what characterises the majority of the season. Not to say that the former is in any way uninteresting. Baltar's time spent with the Cylons continues to give us new insights into Cylon culture, setting up the mystery surrounding the mythical Final Five Cylon models. However, I've always found the interior of the Cylon base stars to be a little lacklustre, and the tendency of scenes set aboard the base stars to feature almost constant cross dissolves and background piano music becomes quite tiring after a while. That being said, the cast are always on top form, and this thread reaches a satisfying payoff in the episodes The Eye of Jupiter and Rapture, where the Colonials and Cylons have a tense standoff while attempting to find another clue to Earth's location as well as taking a break from all your worries, when Baltar is returned to the fleet and undergoes a surreal dreamlike interrogation. As mentioned before, however, the most engaging thread throughout Season 3 is the fallout from the new Caprica. While Sharon is finally recognised as an equal crew member, adopting the call sign Athena, and Lee manages to find his strength again, other characters like Ty and Starbuck are forever damaged by their time on New Caprica. This lingering trauma is tapped for several strong episodes throughout the season, wrestling with trauma, guilt and shame, and fighting to make sense of untold pain and suffering without justification is also a theme at the heart of Maelstrom. This is the episode which featured the shocking death of Kara Thrace. Behind the scenes, a killing off Starbuck proved to be an extremely controversial choice among the cast and crew. Edward James Olmos, who was especially fond of performing opposite Katie Zakoff, even came close to staging somewhat of an uprising against Ronald D. Moore and David Icke in response. Thankfully, the actors were abated when the writer-producer duo explained their plans for the final three episodes. With the trial of Gaia's Baltar fast approaching, Lee Adama makes the startling decision to resign his commission and join Baltar's defence team. As a character, Lee Adama is often a source of frustration for the viewer. While the original Apollo was a straight-laced hero, Lee Adama seems somewhat aimless throughout his first three seasons. However, this is by design. In the Bible for the reimagined Battlestar Galactica, Lee's backstory was not as a combat pilot, but as a test pilot, and one who was planning on resigning from the military altogether after Galactica's originally planned decommissioning. In my opinion, I think this piece of information should have been made more explicit in the show, because it functions somewhat as Rosetta Stone for the character's actions. He comes across as aimless because effectively he is aimless. He becomes the Galactica's CAG out of necessity, not desire. For a brief moment, he seemed to find his calling as commander of the Pegasus, but this is whittled away even before the Cylons come to New Caprica. In The Sun Also Rises, Lee finally finds his true purpose outside of the military, something foreshadowed by his repeated insubordination where he sides with Rosalind more often than his father. Spurred on by Baltar's lawyer, the eccentric Romo Lampkin played by Mark Shepard, Lee takes the stand to espouse his reasoning for defending Baltar in a monologue brilliantly delivered by Jamie Bamber, a performance which allegedly earned him a standing ovation from his fellow cast members on set. I mean, it was an impossible situation. When the Cylons arrived, what could he possibly do? What, what could anyone have done? I mean, ask yourself, what would you have done? What would you have done? In a four-minute speech, Lee provides an impassioned account of all the mistakes, poor judgments, and twisted morality the fleet has been riding on for the entire series, and surmising the full extent of the damage done to the human race as a whole. Colonel Tai used suicide bombers, killed dozens of people, forgiven. Lieutenant Agathon and Chief Tyrrell, they murdered an officer on the Pegasus, forgiven. 
the Admiral instituted a military coup d'etat against the President. Forgiven. And me? I shot down a civilian passenger ship, the Olympic carrier, over a thousand people on board, forgiven. I raised my weapon to a superior officer, committed an act of mutiny, forgiven. And then on the very day when Baltar surrendered to those Cylons, I, as commander of Pegasus, jumped away. I left everybody on that planet alone, undefended for months. I even tried to persuade the Admiral never to return. If I'd had my way, nobody would have made it off that planet. I'd say we're very forgiving of mistakes. And we've had to be. Because, because we're not a civilization anymore. We are a gang. We have to break rules, we have to bend laws, we have to improvise. But not this time, no. Not for Gaius Baltar. You have to die. You have to die because, well, because we don't like you very much. Because you're arrogant. Because you're weak. Because you're a coward. This case, this case is built on emotion, on anger. But most of all, it is built on shame. It's about the shame of what we did to ourselves back on that planet. And we are trying to dump all that guilt and all that shame onto one man and then flush him out the airlock and hope that that just gets rid of it all. But that won't work. That won't work. That's not justice. Not to me. Not to me. As the trial comes to an end and Baltar is narrowly found not guilty, the eruption of the crowd is only a taste of the chaos unleashed at the end of the show's third season. The fleet is ambushed by another Cylon fleet, and as every ship capable of fighting races to mount a desperate defense, Lee spots an unknown ship on his scopes. Meanwhile, Anders, Tyrrell, Ty, and Tori are all drawn together by a strange but familiar song. Said the Joker to the thief. There's too much confusion here. I can't get no relief. That's true. We're Cylons. And we have been from the start. And if this jaw-dropping revelation wasn't enough, the viewer is hit with a two-punch combo as Lee makes contact with the unknown ship. Hi, Lee. Kara? <laughs> Don't freak out, it really is me. I've been to Earth. I know where it is. And I'm gonna take us there. And just to hammer everything home, Bear McCreary's fantastic rendition of All Along the Watchtower guides us through the galaxy, finally settling on a shot of Earth itself. By the end of its third season, Battlestar Galactica was not only a hit for the sci-fi channel, but a genuine cultural phenomenon. Not only had its fresh look and feel caught the attention of non-sci-fi fans, but savvy internet marketing and loving homages to the original series had successfully accrued a passionate fanbase for the series. It had tapped into the cultural zeitgeist in a way no other sci-fi show had done, perhaps since Star Trek The Next Generation but that meant that the pressure was mounting for the show to stick the landing in its final season. Unfortunately, the plans for the fourth season were hampered somewhat by a writer's strike, which threatened to potentially cut the show short. As a result, season four would feature no standalone episodes, and would focus solely on wrapping up the main story arcs. At the turn of the final season, the characters feel the fabric of everything they know slipping away. Fan-favorite characters are revealed as Cylons, Kara Thrace comes back from the dead, and even the Cylons descend into a civil war, when they themselves start to repeat the cycle of destruction ushered in when humanity created the Cylons in the first place. Every relationship, power structure, and alliance seems to be coming apart at the seams. Even a brief alliance with the Cylon rebels is dramatically undercut when the fleet finally reaches Earth, only to discover it's an irradiated wasteland, having succumbed to a Cylon war of its own. Centurions. Similar, but they're not one of ours. The 13th tribe settled here and created their own Cylons. 
And then the machines rose up and killed their masters. 250 skeletons so far from four different sites on the planet using our protocols. What's your point? They're not human. They're Cylon. The 13th tribe was Cylon. The following episodes are truly the bleakest and most desperate of the entire show. Though some more puzzle pieces concerning the final five are dropped, overall an atmosphere of utter hopelessness eclipses the story. Gripped by despair, Tom Zarek and Felix Gaeta, seizing on the lingering hostility towards the Cylons, stage an all-out coup to take control of the fleet. And it's within this penultimate conflict that the real thesis of the story reveals itself. Battlestar Galactica, despite its darkness, is ultimately a very hopeful show. Much like the fleet's reunion at the start of Season 2, too much has been lost to keep fighting. Zarek and Gaeta, while understandable, even sympathetic in their motivations, want to go backwards by holding on to their hatred of the Cylons. The core message of the series, which builds upon Lee's speech during Baltar's trial, is to never give up on one another. Even when these people have lost their homes, family, friends, and even when the Galactica itself is falling apart, the characters have to keep helping each other in order to keep moving forward. These are the Cylons that have died with us since the Alliance. I didn't know they were doing that. Which brings us to the three-part series finale, Daybreak. As the Galactica is on its last legs, Adama launches a volunteer mission to rescue Athena and Agathon's daughter, Hera. Hera, being a human-Cylon hybrid, is the perfect symbol of unity and hope which the end of the season rests on. Even so, the finale still delivers a sledgehammer of a final action sequence, with the Galactica literally smashing full force into a Cylon base while being ripped apart by weapons fire and boarded by Centurions. Where the last episode becomes controversial is in its handling of the long-running, seemingly supernatural element. Ever since the revelation that Head 6 is not a Cylon chip in Baltar's head, and the near-magical properties of the various ancient temples the Galactica crew encounters, this thread was the most potent source of fan speculation. Hence why anticipation was high for the final episode to at last pay off this mystery. But in the end, the most we get is confirmation of some kind of higher power at work, one which has guided them to this point, and one which ultimately leads them to Earth. Because there's another force at work here. There always has been. Whether we want to call that God, or Gods, or some sublime inspiration, or a divine force that we can't know or understand, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's here. It exists. Good and evil, we created those. You want to break the cycle? Birth. Death. Rebirth. Destruction. Escape. Death. And that's in our hands. In our hands only. It's understandable why some fans would find this answer unsatisfying, but then again, I personally don't think any answer would really satisfy. If the show had defined who God was, or revealed it was some supercomputer all along, I don't really see how that's better. While I can see why some people would refer to this particular payoff as unsatisfying, to call the finale overall unsatisfying is very unfair in my opinion. Because in terms of character, plot, and theme, the end of Battlestar Galactica resolves beautifully. The Cylon War comes to a brutal end with Cavill and his ilk destined to die out without their resurrection technology, and the surviving Cylons now living alongside humanity, as perhaps they always should have done. But it's the various character endings which never fail to move me personally in a profound way. The use of flashbacks is a great way of showing the viewer just how far all of these characters have come. Gaius Baltar finally does something truly selfless, allowing him to rekindle his love with Caprica VI. Athena and Agathon succeed in rescuing Hera, even Ty is reunited with Ellen. Seeing so many others get the chance to make a life with those they love makes Adama and Rosalind's end even more heartbreaking. Although they met as rivals and clashed many times, their relationship is so potent and the chemistry so engaging, it was basically inevitable that they would fall in love. 
From the beginning of the second season, these two always stuck by one another, through Laura's cancer, the Cylon occupation, and the futility of the quest for Earth. And having gone through all of that, having finally found the world they were searching for, Laura slips away. Where I think the show sticks the landing in terms of plot and theme is Lee's insistent that the fleet be sent off into the sun, and the human race, as well as the Cylons, can begin anew on this new world. However, as is very characteristic of the show, the ending poses a question to the audience without a solid answer. All of this has happened before. But the question remains. Does all of this have to happen again? And yet, it remains hopeful. Let a complex system repeat itself long enough, eventually something surprising might occur. That too is in God's plan. Fans of the original Battlestar Galactica often wonder what could have been if the show had been allowed to continue. And while I'll always have a soft spot for vocoder-voiced Cylons and laser gun battles, in my view, the reimagined Battlestar Galactica is the fulfillment of that potential. It was a show led by a team who cleverly mined the rich established lore for new avenues of storytelling, and shook up the usual genre conventions to create one of the greatest science fiction television shows ever made. It was a series which brought the space opera genre down to earth, and yet by doing so, it allowed the themes and ideas of the show to resonate with the viewer more profoundly. It was a series which asked tough questions and tackled dark subject matter, yet despite that darkness, it was ultimately a hopeful show. The rich characters of Battlestar Galactica weren't the crew of the Enterprise, they weren't conceived of as superhumans to serve as examples for the audience, but there was power in showing us how even the most flawed and damaged people, who have no business being in the roles they're in, can still find the courage, strength, and the fortitude to do great things. And that's what Battlestar Galactica is ultimately about more than anything else, human beings. Whether they be lost tribes among the stars, or artificial beings searching for purpose. It's a mirror for ourselves, and though we may see a lot of darkness in that reflection, there's still the potential for extraordinary and wonderful things. Battlestar Galactica is the result of years of hard work and dedication from a team who strive to create something truly special, and in this mission, they were most certainly successful. Battlestar Galactica the show may have definitively ended in its fourth season, but it was not the last we would see from this universe. Thank you for watching. If you like my videos, be sure to like, subscribe, and share, and make sure to hit the bell icon to stay up to date with all of my new uploads. If you want to help the channel grow, join my Patreon or YouTube members using the links down below. There you can see videos early, as well as some exclusive content. Speaking of which, I'd like to quickly thank all of my patrons and members who are now appearing on screen. Have a good one, and as always, live long and prosper.